in this, the latest of our Tank Chats Reloaded series, we are going to be talking about the T-72, classic Soviet Cold War main battle tank, uh, which is still in service to a lot of armies around the world. We're also very fortunate because we're going to be talking to somebody who's got personal experience of it, Dag Patchett. Dag is one of our workshop volunteers, but in a previous life, he was a crewman, a tank commander in T-72s. In Tank Chats Reloaded, we'll be revisiting old favourites from the Tank Chat series and taking a new look at these fighting machines. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. The T-72 project began as a replacement for the T-62. But in fact, it's part of a series that you can actually trace right the way back to the T-54-55 and forwards, in fact, to the T-90. With this family of tanks, it's not difficult to see what the priorities were. And there are a lot of shared characteristics. There's a continuity of shape and size, low rounded profiles, and a weight in the region of 34 to 44 tonnes. And that's lighter than most NATO tanks of the period. Rugged simplicity in design, build and maintenance important when tank crew were usually conscripts and from a wealth of different peoples. Lastly, there's an emphasis on firepower. Some of the most powerful guns fitted to tanks anywhere. The T-72 itself is the product of intense competition between two rival companies, Morozov KB in Kharkiv and Ural Vagon KB in Nizhny Tagil. This was supposed to produce a design for the T-64. But because of design problems with that and some fairly intense industrial politicking, both designs, T-64 and T-72, went into production. The whole story of Soviet tank design is like this. We've well, got rival teams competing against one another. Sometimes the results are really good, uh, but there are other times when it just seems a bit counterproductive, really. It's interesting in terms of Warsaw Pact military procurement that for a period in the 1980s, the T-64, T-72 and T-80 were all in production together from rival plants. The tank you see here is a T-72M1. That is a type that was produced um, by the Warsaw Pact countries. Um, and this one actually saw service with the former East German army. An awful lot were sent for export as well. Now the thing about just about all Soviet and post-Soviet tank designs is they are very low to the ground, very rounded profiles compared to other MBTs. And the advantage of that is it makes them much more difficult targets to hit. This is possible because of the use of an autoloader, a carousel device that loads the desired round and charge into the breech. We'll look at that in a bit more detail when we're actually inside the tank. But the main thing here is that if you do away with a human loader, he's the only guy who actually needs to stand up to do his job, get rid of him, and you can make the whole vehicle a lot lower. Now, the gun on this tank is one of the biggest fitted to any MBT. It's a 125 millimeter smoothbore that can fire uh, heat, APFSDS, the thin round, the anti-tank round, or the 9M119 Sphere, and that is a guided anti-tank missile. As you can see from the snorkel tube, the T-72 is designed to be fully submersible, so it can wade water obstacles up to a depth of about five metres. This fits with Warsaw Pact tactics, where all armour was designed to either be able to wade water obstacles or like the BMP series of armoured personnel carriers, be able to swim. If it came to it, blown bridges and bridging kits stuck miles away in a traffic jam would not be a problem. Another feature which is worth mentioning are the groups of tubes either side of the turret. These are 81 millimetre smoke grenade launchers. Uh, they fire white phosphorus smoke grenades. You can drop a pattern of smoke uh, to screen the vehicle. I think most people familiar with tanks will know what these are, but the T-72 has another method of smoke generation. By venting diesel into the exhausts, the tank can deploy a smoke screen from these exhaust ports. 
As you might imagine, in a tank that's been in service since the 1970s, T72 has gone through five major redesigns and quite a number of minor ones. The tank has also been used as the basis for a number of other vehicles, including, as we've seen recently in Ukraine, the TOS-1, a T72 chassis where the turret has been removed and replaced with a 30-tube thermobaric missile launcher. Well, those are the basics of the T72 and its development. I would now like to talk to Dag about his experience of the vehicle. Dag, good morning. Good morning. Just been through Tank Fest. Uh, thank you very much for volunteering to come down here. Um, what I'd like you to do is really just sort of talk us through your experience of T72 and also what it was like to be uh, crewing the vehicle. Okay. Um, briefly to my background, I was a T-72 commander in the East German Army um, from 86 to um, 89. Um, I still hold technically a full driving license. I'm fully trained to operate the gunnery equipment. And of course, I was and still probably able in charge of commanding the tank in the various conditions to oper it operates in. Um, overall, I think uh, now, in hindsight, my experience in the army, especially in a tank crew, is pretty much the same as in any other army. Um, lots of work. Uh, it is a kind of dangerous life, even if you're not in combat. Um, and uh, you have to deal with all the design faults and uh, positive aspects of the tank and fit your life around it for a certain period when you are on exercise and so on. Now, you've got quite a range of experience across a number of different vehicles. I mean, especially here at the, the Tank Museum, mm -hmm. we've got things like Chieftain, Challenger 1. How does T-72, would you say, how does it compare to other vehicles of that same Cold War period? Um, overall, I would say that Chieftain and Challenger, um, especially due to the different design principles, are very difficult for me to operate. Um, I'm just not used to such a heavy vehicle okay. um, to, to drive it, to steer it. It behaves totally different. Well, both of them behave totally different to a T-72, which yeah. is relatively agile uh, for a tank, um, very fast, very easy to operate. Mm. And especially important is to remember that T-72s were designed for conscript armies. So yes. they had to be simplified to, a, some, to some degree to make it easy to train Conscripts, with, which are in the army or in the crew for a relatively short period, become an effective gunner as quickly as possible. Okay, yeah. We're always told that it's quite a, a sort of rugged, uh, reliable vehicle. Were there any major mechanical problems with it, engineering issues? No, not as far as I remember. I was in the, a lucky position to command the training tank for nearly all of my time in the army, which mm. meant it was out on exercise for various different um, companies or battalions within the regiment from Monday to Friday. Um, and it was only usually small things like gaskets, uh, seals had to be replaced or something The, the like sort that. of stuff you'd expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah normal, yeah. normal things, which are unpleasant, mm -hmm. certainly in winter and sometimes where you had to fix them because uh, they, you needed a few more joints in your arms to get there. Mm -hmm. But overall, we had very rare full breakdowns where the tank wouldn't move at all. Mm. Um, as long as you had batteries and as long as you had compressed air to start the vehicle, that was fine. You could always get it moving somehow. I think one of the other things about uh, this is um, these vehicles, if they're worked hard and often, mm -hmm. um, they tend to be more reliable. Uh, if they're left in the tank shed for several months, then you know, you're in for a, um, a world of problems. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree. That was the same actually in the East German army. Those battle-ready tanks, when they were taken out for exercise after sitting in a hangar for weeks or months, they had much more pro or man many more problems than we had in our daily used tanks, effectively mm -hmm. daily drivers. Um, and that showed, especially in broken hose pipes, um, yeah. things like that, uh, broken units, because suddenly they were, um, had all the vibrations to deal with, which they didn't have to. So uh, we had more issues on those tanks, but still nothing major as in this tank is off the road for half a day, a day or something like that. That's extraordinary. Um, certainly from rather different to our experience, mm -hmm. as I said. 
Um, now, one of the things, uh, we've got this T72M museum yeah. here. Um, one of the things a lot of people do remark on is the snorkel. Yeah. Um, ha have you had experience of using that, using the, the deep wading capacity? Um, I start from the back end. Um, I cross the Elbe River 10 times during day and night exercise. Right. Um, at various levels, um, but uh, overall, it sounds very strange to a lot of people, um, and I understand that, but there were a lot of safety mechanisms built in. You had to be a fully qualified swimmer, not just saying, I can swim. You had to prove it with a certificate or with a test mm -hmm. before you were allowed to do it. During winter time, we had our rebreather training. Yeah. So we were actually put into a tank turret, which was then flooded with water and everything so that we could learn how it feels inside a tank, how to get out of, how to fill the tank with water, mm. and then how to get out. And only when you pass all these winter trainings, then you were allowed as a crew to get into the proper one, into mm. the uh, river crossing training. Um, even there, there were three stages, safety stages. We were shown the recovery um, action, um, including the engineers, the, the divers and everything. Mm. Um, Recovering a tank which stopped underwater takes about 10 minutes maximum. Okay, um, that's really rough. Everything quick. is prepared. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the entire tank preparation before going into the water was between 30 and 45 minutes mm. in three stages, including an overpressure test yeah. um, done on the vehicle itself. All the equipment required is actually on the tank. We don't have to wait for anybody else. Mm. We have it on the tank. We can do it ourselves. Um, and then there was a final stage about 20, 30 meters before we went into the water for the, and then that was a make or break call. And then it was just go forward, come out on the other end and it works. Mm. One of the things that people are really interested in uh, when they look at these vehicles is what is it like to live inside, you know, to live in and off the tank? And I'm particularly thinking about, you know, if you're in, say, MBC conditions, yeah. you know, you might be um, locked in there for three or four days. Yeah. What was that like? Well, that is uh, a question I very often get, especially at Tank Day or uh, Tank Fest, sorry. Um, because compared to, as we said earlier, Chieftain and, and Challenger, the tank is tiny. Um, however, uh, it might sound a bit surprising that you can live a relatively uh, good life inside. Once you get used to the tank, once you know what to take off easily, uh, how you can, uh, where you can put your limbs without interfering with anything. Um, for me as a commander, for example, I could actually sleep outstretched. Well, slightly bent, but still outstretched. Yeah. The driver had a little bit of a problem, but you can, for example, imagine that his seat was inclined as a business class seat, uh, not quite flat, but at an angle, but still relatively comfortable. The short straw was um, given to the gunner, unfortunately, but he was mostly on guard duty and his preferred place, especially in winter, was the warm radiator on the outside. Yes. So unless it was raining uh, or snowing, um, he had actually the warmest place because the T-72 does not have an auxiliary power unit, which means once the tank gets cold, it is cold and it stays cold for a very long time. Mm. Yes, yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, and you've got the advantage, of course, that T-72 has three crew. Yes. Something like Chieftain has four. Yes. So there's, you know, like that much more going on. Yes. Um, I suppose the upside of that is when you're on stag, you can split it between four guys, even in all three um, in this vehicle. So, yeah. Could you tell us what is your favourite um, thing about T-72? Mm -hmm. And perhaps what's your least favourite? The favourite thing is really the... Uh, often discussed autoloader. That is something which is, from an engineering perspective, amazing. We'll uh, perhaps talk a bit more okay. detail about that yep. when we're actually inside the vehicle. Yep. That's, okay. that's quite surprising. Um, yeah. the, uh, the least is sometimes the, ma the daily maintenance, uh, first parade, last parade. Yes. That was quite extensive. Um, on the other hand, that was partially down to the fact that we were re battle ready effectively 24 seven. Yeah. And we always prepared um, in the evening to be called up in the middle of the night and go somewhere. Mm. Um, so that 
led to a very extensive first parade, last parade routine, yeah. which even with three people could take nearly 40 minutes. Yes, I think that's pretty well universal. Um, yeah, but, it, but it's still the least it's, it's, favorite it's thing. It's one of those tank things, isn't yes. it? You have to get through it. Well, thank you very much for that, Dag. Um, I think it's time for us to go and take a look inside. Okay, that's fine. No problem, thank you. So we looked at an East German T-72M um, inside the museum. Now we're going to have a look at this one, um, Sandy Colored Beast. Um, and we're actually going to look at it in a bit more detail and get inside. Right, so as we said earlier, um, T-72 is a bit different to British tanks. You've got a three-man crew. So you've got driver, commander and gunner. Dag, you are down in the driver's position. I'd have to say, I'd have most tank driving positions are pretty crowded. Uh, that looks very small indeed. Um, it is, but it has advantages because if you go cross country, you don't really have much space to be thrown around in. And so it has some advantages at least. Um, it's not very comfortable, I agree, especially when the hatch is down, but uh, overall it is what it is and you have to live with it. As with all, yes. Okay, um, could you talk us around the, you know, the controls and really give us an idea of what this tank is like to drive? Yes, so the general setup is a pretty basic left clutch, middle is the brake, which also acts as a handbrake, and on the right you have the accelerator, two steering levers, left, and right, gear change, seven forward gears, one reverse. Here in front of me, in the dark, the red boxes are the fire extinguishing system. It works fully automatic. Mm -hmm. And you also see at least the pressure gauge for the compressed air system within the tank. On the left, we have the instrument panel with the fuses behind that little flap here. Um, and at the right shoulder, four large batteries to get the tank started and um, supported. The other interesting thing down here is the control for the rear louvers to control the airflow through the radiator. And down here we see the manual fuel pump to prime the uh, system with the stopcock. One interesting thing which I don't know if the chieftain has said is the gyro compass which we use when we go underwater for example. Right, well that was great, thanks Dag. Um, that's the driver's position. Mm -hmm. Let's move on up into the turret. Yeah, okay. Right, so we are looking at the top of the turret and you can see the general layout. You've got the commander's hatch on that side, gunner's hatch on this side. Dag, could you talk us through some of the detail? Um, I mean, to begin with, one of the things that occurs to me is having a forward opening hatch isn't a great idea. Um, again, personally, because I don't know any better, um, it is a good idea. It provides uh, at least some protection, even against the elements, uh, especially in autumn, winter and spring. Um, in battle, if it would be effective, I really don't know. Um, but uh, at least it gives a sense of protection of, against incoming fire from infantry. Okay. Um, and then on the back of the commander's hatch, you've got the heavy machine gun mad. Um, what sort of weapon was on that? I'm presuming it's anti-aircraft. Yeah, it was uh, the anti-air, or is the anti-aircraft weapon of the T-72. Um, it usually holds a NSVT 12.7 millimeter machine gun. So classed as a heavy machine gun in the Eastern Bloc. Mm. Um, it is completely manually operated. So it, compared to a, say, Russian T-64 mm. or maybe a Challenger nowadays, um, you have to get out, you have to load it, you have to aim with your eyes and hope that you get the helicopter before he gets you. Mm, yeah, um, that is, I mean, even going back to Chieftain Day, the GPMG, the yeah. operator from inside the Commander Kugler. Yeah. Um, there's a circular fitting just here. I'm presuming that that is the, um, the hole that you put the schnorkel in. Am I right? No, that is oh. wrong. Unfortunately, this little hatch is part of the autoloader system and it opens up when the uh, stub of the spent uh, cartridge gets um, thrown out. Ah, right. The snorkel is actually fitted into the little hatch within the uh, gunners. Just here. The little circular yeah. hatch there, yes. I see, yeah. Okay, um, well that's great. I mean, um, that is obviously the exterior. We talked about the 
um, 125 millimeter gun, smoked uh, grenade launchers earlier. Um, let's get inside, have a look at the inside of the turret. Yes, yeah, okay. So, Dag, uh, you are back in your original position as a serving soldier, as a tank commander. I'd have to say you're looking quite comfortable there. Yeah. Uh, you are over on the right-hand side of the turret. That's the, the commander's slot. Could you talk us through uh, the controls and what you've got about you? Yeah, sure. So right in front of me is a combined day and night vision sight for the commander. Um, it doesn't need any preparation. Uh, you just flip a, a switch and then you can operate it in night vision mode um, with or without an infrared searchlight. You also have two additional separate periscopes and the entire cupola rotates. So despite only having two periscopes, we can still get some kind of all-round vision. Obviously not as good as in the Chieftain or Challenger, but uh, it's not that we only look forward. Um, on my right hand side, there is the tank radio, uh, short wave R123 with the power supply. There are some units which belong to the stabilizing system. Um, there is the manual or semi-automatic control system for the autoloader should it fail. And on the left, obviously the breech block um, and behind me uh, are certain control boxes, again, for the autoloader and stabilization equipment. And right at the bottom of the turret is another fuel tank, which also holds some of the charges um, which we carry, which are not in the autoloader itself. And the diesel acts as a kind of coolant to keep the temperature rel relatively even. So it's looking fairly um, sort of simple and straightforward down there. Uh, I take it it's the commander who actually operates the, the comms yes, kit. That would be different to British tanks. Obviously, we've got a loader who also d uh, doubles as an operator. But here you're saying the, the commander actually uh, operates the comms kit as well. Yes, that is true. The commander is responsible for all uh, operations of the radio system. So he has an additional switch box in w which he can switch from external radio traffic to intercom. So that is one thing a commander needs to be aware of in the T-72. If he wants to talk to his crew, he actually has to flick a switch. Now, a lot of people will be interested in the auto loader. So what I suggest we do now is if we put you into the gunner's position, perhaps you could talk us through the operation of that and the actual gun kit itself. Yes, of course. So you now um, over on the left-hand side of the turret in the gunner's position. Could you talk us through the gun kit, the gunnery controls? Sure. Um, in front of me is a day sight with an integrated laser rangefinder. A um, bit further down is the manual or the handle for the gun control when it's in stabilized mode. It is different to the uh, gun control fitted in the UK tanks and British tanks in that you move the entire control unit left and right to mm. traverse the turret and you move the handles up and down to elevate or depress the gun. The hand or control unit also includes the firing buttons for electric firing of the main uh, gun and the coaxial machine gun and it's also used to operate the laser rangefinder. So if you're engaging a target, you, oh, you don't really have to take your hands off um, except a brief moment, which I will come to later on. Um, to the left of the day side, we have the separate night side. Um, that is an inactive night side, so unfortunately you don't need the very large searchlight, infrared searchlight, um, with a range of up to 800 meters, which is one of the significant drawbacks of the T-72. A bit further down, you see a little rectangular um, indicator that tells the gunner how much rounds of each type he still has in the loader, in the carousel. And you also have down here the manual control for turret traverse, for gun elevation, and an indication of where your main gun is actually pointing at at the moment. The little red marks indicate when you're over that part, it, to the left or to the right, your gun is outside of the hull envelope of the tank. So you have to, you have to tell the driver 
that he does not drive into any trees because mm. the gun is pointing sideways. But finally, right to my left is a turret lock and the control unit for the extra smoke um, grenade dischargers. And up here is a radio control set should the gunner have to take over radio traffic with the outside world. Okay. Um, now, right in the middle, I'm sort of looking down at it. Mm -hmm. um, behind the breech of the gun yeah. is the auto loader. Um, could you just sort of talk us through the way that actually works? Yes. Um, the autoloader sequence is quite long and uh, it is a little bit difficult to explain because various things also happen in parallel. Um, in general, the gun, when, when it is fully stabilized, go, uh, moves into a specific location, pre-programmed, and is then locked. A very important thing which people always ask is, the gunner, will the gunner see anything? Yes, the gunner has a fully stabilized optical system which has nothing to do with the gun at that moment. It's completely decoupled. The gunner can actually engage new targets whilst we are loading the gun. After the commander told the gunner which um, round to select, the gunner has a selection switch here for the high explosives, heat round or the um, APFDS round and he selects the correct type. There is a memory system within the autoloader which knows exactly where the round is and the only other thing he has to do, pressing a little button and that's it. Then the autoloader springs into action and it goes through the sequence until the gun is ready to be fired. Then a lot of work starts to happen simultaneously. As I mentioned before, this subframe will come up the spent cartridge will be ejected through that little hatch here, which we saw earlier on. Um, then underneath yourself, the carousel starts to rotate. The system knows where the next round of the type you want is, so it doesn't endlessly go around in a circle. It goes left, right, whatever the best and quickest um, position is. Then an elevator will move up here, will ram in the round. It will be lowered a little bit, rams in the cartridge, so the charge, which automatically closes the breech block. When all this is done, the gun gets released and automatically aligns with the line of the optical system. So whatever the, the gunner is pointing at, the gun will actually go into that position. There's only a minor um, correction necessary usually, and then it's up to the commander to save fire, or if you are a well-trained crew and you know your gunner very well, you leave it to him. And, um, you know, the million dollar question um, from, you know, recent news, mm -hmm. um, you've got the, the carousel, the magazine effectively, underneath the turret. Yes. Does this make it uh, more vulnerable to top attack weapons? Uh, because we've seen an awful lot of T-72s minus their turrets. Um, I think it is an inherent problem, a design problem in itself, um, but I'm also relatively certain that uh, the pros and cons were considered. Um, from a balancing point, obviously, to have a heavy, it's better to have a heavy load at the bottom of a tank uh, when you have it inside instead of the end of a turret. Um, on the other hand, the turret roof is the weakest spot on pretty much any tank. And if that gets penetrated and you then have um, an explosion inside or just fragments flying around and igniting the ammunition, yes, um, it will brew up and the turret by design will come off. But okay. we are talking about nearly 900 kilograms of ammunition in the, in the carousel alone. So um, that is kind of inevitable, unfortunately. Mm. That's interesting because, you know, we, obviously we've always known that keeping rounds um, out of the turret, keeping them in the hull is a safety feature mm -hmm. in case of a hit on the turret. Um, but it's, you know, it's looking to me as though the fact you've got the carousel down there, it's not actually making things significantly worse in the way that we've been told. I don't know what you'd, you'd sort of think about that. In, in my view, um, it is uh, actually relatively safe because um, 
most of the time, even if the uh, information might be a little bit different, we train for a defense po or in a defense position. Mm. So only our turret was mostly available uh, to, as, as, as target. Mm. Um, in a normal battle, uh, on, in open plains, yes, there probably were hits, but um, I think, even if it sounds a bit strange, that overall the probability is relatively low. And you must not forget that a tank is usually not on its own. Mm. The tank is there with infantry around you, with helicopter support on your own from your own side, bombers, artillery and everything else, mm. and anti-aircraft weapons. So once you have the combined um, units working together, um, I think the likelihood is relatively low. And this is one of the problems in Ukraine at the moment, that they don't have, in my opinion, enough um, air defense systems to protect the tanks when they go into action. Now, there was one thing in the British Army, um, I'm talking about a few years ago now, there used to be this um, idea that um, T-72 crewmen um, had their arms ripped off by the autoloader. Um, was there ever any truth in that? Yes, so um, in my three years in the army, I have never heard of a broken arm um, due to the autoloader. Um, on the gunner's side, you have a sliding panel, which you just bring back, and when you're then in your normal combat position, having your hands on the gun control, there's absolutely no way you can accidentally move your arm into the way of the autoloader. You actually have to lift it up and bring it over here, but that is not something you should do, especially not when the gun is operating in sta stabilized modus um, and the autoloader being turned on. Then, of course, I agree, you can do it, but you're not supposed to have your arm there. Um, a similar um, security device, safety device, is fitted to the, gunner, uh, to the commander seat. Unfortunately, it makes moving around a little bit awkward for the filming, so we took it off. Um, but it is designed in the same way, um, and the, it actually ends up at the commander's shoulder, so it's even more difficult to get your left arm in the way of the gun. I think that's probably just another product of the British Army rumor mill. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks. Yes, Thanks very much for having me. Hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, subscribe, and if you can, support us on Patreon.